Um, my name's Simon Russell, and I'm going to talk about, um, well, my talk's called Seeing Sounds, and it's about visualising music and a little bit about sonification. Um, but I realised how much time I've got, and I don't have a lot of time, so it's going to be pretty quick. Um, I'm Simon Russell, I'm a motion graphic designer, and do a bit of art stuff as well. Um, and motion graphic design, if you don't know, is somewhere between sort of animation, um, design, uh, I do quite a lot of 3D, so um, it kind of goes into visual effects, um, and it's sort of, and it's to do with film as well, and cameras, and, and all sorts of things, and it's kind of one of those kind of, I guess, hybrid things, which takes in a lot of everything, um, and I'm based in Plymouth. Um, so this is my reel, uh, gives you a gist of the kind of thing I do. Okay, that's my showreel. It's kind of the best bits cut together um, of what I do. Oop. And so, um, what I'm going to talk about briefly, what is visual music, a tiny bit of history about it, um, my history of it, kind of software I use, why, <laughs> and kind of the things I kind of want to look at in the future. Um, so visualising music, again, is quite a nebulous area. Um, on one level, you can sort of say it and people grasp it quite intuitively. It's like you hear a piece of music and it's just kind of what visuals go with it. And you hear the drums as circles or something like that and pianos as little coloured bits. And it's it's that kind of thing. I guess everyone's got their own version of that. Um, there's the area of, son area of sonification. So you can use data or, or whatever um, and then turn that into sounds, and then you've got things like parameter mapping, orderification. Um, it can be very tight syncing between audio and visual. Um, it can be used as composition. It ties into things like synesthesia, the neurological condition where different sounds might trigger visuals in someone's head, or you know, different letters might have different textures. Um, it ties into kind of, I guess, Wagner's idea of Gesamtkunstwerk, the complete work of art. So kind of audio, visual, a factory, like smell and all these things. Um, and then you've got all sorts of digital sort of newer applications, kind of things like Brian Eno does with some of his apps, which are kind of like audio visual instruments. But all in all, it's quite a nebulous um, area. Um, Hannah Davis does a really good uh, talk explaining some of them more database sonification um, things, so you can look that up if you're interested. Um, so it really, in a nutshell, it's kind of about parameter mapping. So it's kind of taking the amplitude, say, of the music, how loud it is, and mapping it to um, the size of something, so, or mapping color to pitch, or amplitude to height, or position to pitch, or something like that. Um, that's kind of what visual music is. If you're driving a visuals from the music, sonification kind of goes the other way. So you're driving the audio from the data. So you could have, um, you know, some, some graph that kind of goes up and down, represents some data, and that will push the audio up and down. Uh, but that's it very quickly. So again, super fast, what, where does visual music start? quite possibly Newton. So he had his kind of color spectrum that he found by shooting white light through a prism. And he pondered, this the image in the top left, can I point to it? There. Um, he pondered whether the notes, um, uh, that the notes could be mapped to that. So uh, an octave of notes could be mapped to the colors. Um, you've got kind of early attempts at um, color organs there. Um, I guess, round the start of the 
20th century, you've got lots of kind of attempts. You've got in theosophy and people like Sky Arbin trying things. That's what the kind of cool images down the bottom are kind of visualizations from um, uh, theosophy. Um, and anyway, so time moves on. You've got people like Oscar Fischinger, um, Norman McLaren. You've got um, James and John Whitney doing things in the top right over there, you've got uh, the Atari music visualizer, which is super cool. Um, I'd love one of those. But this is kind of pre-digital, I guess. Um, people are starting to do really interesting things. I mean, you've got as well, Oscar Fischinger worked. Um, he ended up doing stuff for Disney and Fantasia, which is a really good, ambitious example of some kind of, of some visual music. Time goes on and we're starting to get into a visual, into the digital era. Um, You've got Michelle Gagne, you've got um, uh, people like Beeple who do really cool kind of visual music. Um, um, you've got Michelle Gondry and um, Adam Rutherford doing Gans Graft. And I'm going to kind of stop there because there's so many things now and it's hard to look back on, well, hard to look at the whole scene now because there's so many different things happening. I just don't have time. Um, but so <laughs> this is where I get I get to. Um, anyhow, uh, so for me, uh, the kind of idea of visual music started when I was in school doing GCSE art, and uh, the teacher showed us Miss Greenhoff. Hello, um, the teacher Miss Greenhoff showed showed us Kandinsky and sort of introduced the idea of um, kind of visual music. Um, of the blurring of those two kind of dimensions, blurring of image with the sound. Um, and to Kandinsky, images were sound. It was quite likely he was synesthetic as well. So he had quite a kind of complete um, experience of it. And he tried to really kind of systematize the whole system. But that's where it started for me. I thought that's a really interesting idea for my GCSE final piece. I drew, uh, painted a piece of house music. Um, so this is my first video just when starting college of trying to visualize some music. Just kind of skip it on. Anyway, you sort of get the idea. It, it's fairly basic, but um, you know, it does the job and that's driving the visuals from the music. And then it sort of, I carried on using After Effects and Cinema 4D. And then um, a friend of mine, Andy, sort of said, just just do something ambitious and sort of really go for it. And, and so I did. Um, and I made this piece kind of, it's called Disco. And again, I'm just going to skip forward on it a bit. Um, it's a kind of, oh, where are we? It's a kind of, dystopian dubstep kind of mad mad thing uh, I'll start it here maybe um <laughs> If you look up disco, um, disco of a Y, you can you can have a look at that in full. Um, I kind of using Cinema 4D um, and After Effects. That's kind of it. it it's hard to do because um, I guess the software isn't super well suited um, for doing that kind of work. And you sort of have to make the music, then make the visuals, and then look at it again, and keep going backwards and forwards. And it's it's not a very fluid process. It's quite hard work, and you sort of hit a natural limit. Um, I mean, you, you could go further, um, but it's, it's difficult. Um, and some of the challenges of making visual music, it's, it's hard to get that instant feedback of getting the audio and the visuals and seeing them together because it isn't it isn't just a matter of kind of plugging in a beat and um, plugging in, you know, a shape and watching it drive the shape. It kind of, on one level it is, but there's quite a large psychological area where it's got to look and feel right. Because um, if it doesn't, 
if it doesn't have that kind of essence, it doesn't look and feel right. It, it's got quite a lot of, you need to do quite a lot of interpretation and tweaking and, and playing with stuff to make it feel right. And I think that's what you sometimes get with some visual music-y stuff or, or visuals which are driven by the music is it's just kind of this really dirty waveform driving, I don't know, some graphic equaliser thing and it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. Um, you've got different sort of point two, you've got different software for each aspect. So Ableton or whatever, Cubase is great for music, not good for visuals and vice versa. Cinema 4D, After Effects, whatever, great for visuals, not so good for music. The whole grammar, I guess, of visual music or of synesthesia here isn't worked out. There's not set ways of doing things. So you're, you sort of have to um, invent it as you go along. Uh, next point your brain's very good at hearing a piece of music, it, music and separating it and seeing going, those are the drums, those are the synths and kind of seeing it spatially. And there's a lot of processing, I guess, in your brain uh, uh, of how you interpret it, interpret it. But if you get an MP3, it's just a compressed wave and you've got to either unpick that. So you can even do FFM analysis and look at all the frequencies and try and look at each one of those. Um, or better, you can get hold of the source files and kind of have each um, each layer of fire, each instrument outputted so you can manipulate and visualize to each one of those separately. Better again is getting the MIDI, which is a kind of digital format, which um, is very, very clean and which kind of drives the samples. Um, and as I said, it's kind of easy to see what you think it should be like. It's kind of hard to make it. Um, there's a resolution issue, whereas video generally is, you know, 25, 30, maybe even 60 frames a second. Um, so that's 60 flashes, 30 flashes a second, whereas audio is, you know, 48,000 um, vibrations a second. So you're dealing in quite different, I guess, not quite dimensions, but kind of levels. Um, and if you want to do something that's very directly driving the visuals from the music very directly. There's a big translation gap between those kind of two frequencies. Um, for me, what's difficult as well is I'm not a musician. So either I get other people to do the music, I do slightly rubbish music, <laughs> or, you know, it's it's so, you know, and, and using commercial music, you, you know, you can't do one because it's licensed and two because you can't pull it all apart. So that's that's another challenge. So it's kind of there's some ways around it but it's either done through collaboration which is difficult as well if you know exactly what you want and you know it, 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 you know anyway waffled enough on that so then i started using houdini which is kind of it's a piece of 3d software it's mainly used for films visual effects blowing things up hence this image um but it's hugely powerful and it can deal with audio. All the things Houdini can do are it can process audio natively, uh, it can read audio and MIDI, uh, and it's got all the animation tools. Um, it's quite a low level concept, so it's very powerful. Excuse me. And you can drive um, audio from geometry or geometry from audio. It's just a really interesting piece of software. Um, this is the difficulty with it a little bit. This is a, a graph of the kind of learning curves of different software. You've got Maya and Blender and stuff at the bottom, and then you've got someone's drawn a Houdini learning curve. And it isn't, it, it really isn't that difficult, but it it's not it's not super easy to pick up. So it took me a little while. Um I'm doing audio in it, not many people, hardly anyone does audio in it. So it's quite underdocumented. It's a steep learning curve, and that low-level nature of it just means it takes some time, but it, you can do some super cool stuff in it. Um, so this is one um, project, just as an example. So the the all the audio here is oh skipping on. Can't even control the slideshow. All the audio here is driven um, by the geometry. So it's kind of a sonification thing. It's not. The visuals aren't drawn from the geometry. The geometry is is um, creating the frequency. So as things go up, there'll be higher frequency. Um, and so on, I'll just play it.
so you can see with that as well because Houdini's got all particles and everything else built into it it's quite easy to add those nice little touches um, it's very sophisticated kind of animation program so that's nice to be able to do everything there um, this is another one I, I started using there's a Google project called Google Magenta um, where they look at machine learning and music um, and there's lots of different strands to that um, but one of them is kind of an automatic kind of piano generator. It kind of, it will, it sort of plays out what sounds like someone who's a bit drunk playing the piano. It's not quite coherent. It's not there yet sounding perfectly like a human. But it's it's interesting for me because one, it gives me an endless amount of MIDI data to play with. And MIDI data is good because it's clean. Um, and um, also there's no licensing issues with it at all. So... You know, and it's an interesting process doing, working with um, a sort of machine learning model like that, because you're more kind of herding it and setting up different parameters and then recording what it puts out. And it's more like shepherding rather than direct control. But I just took basically the MIDI, MIDI, MIDI that this spat out and created some visualizations from it. So this is my setup in um, Houdini. Um, and it's a node-based uh, software, so you can see on the right all the different nodes. Um, and each one is probably a different sound or a little different system. Um, and it kind of randomizes things in a different way. The graph below is showing all the MIDI cues and their their value, how high or low they are. I, I'm not sure if that's pitch fair or whatever, but it gives you an idea. Um, so this is a piece. It's kind of so the, the music is generated by machine learning and the visuals are kind of generative um, and I can just change a random seed and maybe different each time. I'll uh, just have a look. Here we go. I'll just pause it there but you kind of you get the idea um this is another um magenta based oh i can't control this another magenta based project um so I'll just skip that one through um this is another magenta-based project. The algorithm, you give it one chord to start with, one to finish with, and it interpolates um, its way through it. And so the colours are automatically sampled as well from a Gustav Klimt painting. Skip it ahead, right to the end, where it gets more complex, and you say... Another kind of technique, so uh, Houdini's kind of generating a random noise which triggers these different voices at different pitches and it also um, triggers the kind of visuals you'll see. Again, I'll just play a little bit of it. What's cool about it and what's cool about um, Houdini is it, it, I'm not sure if this would be in stereo this stream, but you'll hear the sounds on the left, on the left, on the right, on the right. Um, potentially that, that could be full 360 or however many speakers or whatever you know, however you want to imagine it, you've got the ability to kind of um, represent the sound spatially in whatever 3D um, space you want to.
what I really like about doing um, things like this is it's it's not like the animation I was used to doing where I describe like I set everything and, and am explicit about everything. It's really interesting to kind of set up a framework and just see how it develops and you know hit render and then you know find out find out what comes out the other end. It's it's a bit more interesting. Um, so a lot of this stuff I got into just in an exploratory way, just because I was interested in it, but then it started to lead to some commercial work. This is something I did for 59 Productions um, and um, a piece um, for Essa Pekka Salonen. I think I've spelled his name wrong, so apologies. Um, but it was called Array and it was in a tunnel in the Barbican in London. Um, So that's the tunnel it was in. Let me just skip on. So it's, we just transcribed the MIDI and then it kind of led the height of the. I'll just skip skip through that and there was there was other sections um you had these kind of ooh, things anyway i'll skip on anyway so i'll skip on so also i started getting into using um, a pen plotter so you output an svg which is like an ai file or a vector file um and then it's just a robot arm with a pen on it uh here we go here's it working So again, Houdini being Houdini, you can export um, SVGs out of it. So again, I, I didn't really need to go anywhere else apart from into Inkscape to uh, do the final final step. So this piece is called Auto Kandinsky. Um, so it, I took a piece of MIDI um, music from uh, Alexander Skryabin, um, who's one of the people I mentioned earlier, and then used it to generate a series of kind of um, randomized uh, plots, basically. Um, and I could, it could generate hundreds, thousands pretty quickly, then I just picked my favorite. So um, this is a sort of close up of one of the pieces, but that's it. So that's, I think, kind of 30 seconds of the music uh, there. Um, and it's it's just very automated and you get quite nice variations in the system and I just pick my favorites and plot them. Um, and also using the same algorithm, I could do a version where I created an animation. So this is the animated version. Um, there's also a um, AR um, augmented reality version of that. So you've, there's just an app called Artivive. So you point your phone um, at the picture and then in your screen, you'll see that animation play. And that's quite cool. Um, and then another plotter based one I did um, kind of sound circles. So this one, instead of reading MIDI, uh, you, I look at a very small, like a second or half a second chunk of audio. Um, and look at lots of different frequency bands and read the strength of each frequency band. Um, and that gives me these kind of circles here. So this is one I did for a friend, um, this piece of drum and bass music. Um, so each circle, the lowest frequencies are on the outside or highest frequencies in the middle. Um, so that's one there, framed up. Uh, there's a white one. Um, this is one using a similar kind of thing and it uses a FFM analysis just of looking at lots of different frequencies. I, I think sampled a lot of different frequency bands here. Um, and the audio is sampled from Pattern Radio, which is another Google um, AI uh, thing, which looks at a vast trove of data, uh, sound recordings and lets you zoom um, right into it and just explore it in a really kind of cool, interesting way. Um, so that's some audio from a whale. And it's kind of looks like a fish, which is cool. Um, again, it's just 
I'm always looking for different ways to just getting away from this simple idea of sort of reading sheet music from left to right. So this is rotated um, and stretched along. Um, so this is the, this is it, another similar one, um, just done time lapse. It's quite noisy actually, the plotter. And this, it can take several hours to do a kind of dense plot. Um, but again, I found it really satisfying and nice to be able to work with pens and paper again uh, after seeing stuff on screen for so long. It's really lovely to have actual objects. Um, um, so anthropophony is a, a term uh, meaning basically human sounds um, and it's it's and uh, it's lots of in interesting work called soundscape ecology based on uh, the work of uh, Dr. Bernie Krauss, which is is worth a, um, a Google if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, again, it's just another kind of really high level sampling of loads of different um, bands and then plotting it out. Um, and, and it's just I really like the detail and it's really interesting kind of exploring and seeing what shapes come out of a sound um it's kind of it's data visualization in in lots of ways uh, it needn't even be audio uh, it would technically work for anything um biophony meaning life rather than just humans so again this is um sampling of a uh, rainforest sounds and in healthy ecology the whole spectrum would be filled up each each kind of animal or whatever, uh, finds a niche within the audio spectrum. Um, again, another representation of that, done as a kind of circle. Um, that's the one you saw in pretty quick. Okay. So that's, that's sort of what I've been doing. Um, and then thinking about how I'd like to kind of move things forward. Real time would be really interesting, um, working uh, with a little bit of Unity or Unreal or something and making it kind of more spontaneous rather than pre-processed. Uh, um, installations would be um, interesting as well, and especially with the spatial audio, quite complex kind of 3D sound. Um, systems could be set up relatively easily. Uh, automating the whole process, I think, is quite interesting as well. Uh, just feeding in MIDI and using kind of AI transcription techniques to kind of break the music apart and and kind of um, create visualizations that way. But really, just kind of carrying on doing the art, really, and just exploring things um, as well. I'd certainly like to look at sort of a three D printing, maybe kind of CNC. Um, and prototyping and that kind of thing. But again, lots lots of things to explore. Um, I mean, I guess why? Originally I did it just out of, just it being interesting. And I think that's really it. It is kind of curiosity-based research in a lot of ways, but it taps into lots of other areas. It's about remapping one kind of field to another. Um, and that's what happens a lot in the brain. Um, Certainly with our senses, if you look at something like David Eagleman's doing with his sort of bracelet and haptic vest, um, and he talks a lot about our brain's ability just to be able to sort of automatically do this and sort of be able to process one kind of field or type of data and, and sort of create meaning out of it and kind of unravel it. And it, it in many ways, it sort of ties into that. It's linked to language and psychology and technology and, and art. And it's just it's just an interesting mix, whether something interesting or useful comes out of that, out of visual music per se, I don't know. I mean, I'm getting some work from it, I'm doing things like this, but I'm not sure where it's a go, but I just I just find it interesting. Um, and really, uh, that's me. My website is simonfarussell.com, that's for my more motion graphic stuff, and my plots and stuff are on simonrussell.art. Okay, um, I'll probably be around online um, after this talk as well, so um, let me know if you've got any questions. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.